So the vision after the sermon, or uh, another title, is Jacob Wrestling with the Angel. This is from 1888, which is that breakthrough year for Gauguin. So it's the first work I'm showing you that I want to focus on as an example of his own style, where he's put different influences together. It's actually painted back in pont aven in Brittany, um, that he's returned to stay there into the next year as well escaping from Paris partly because he he's can then be living somewhere that's uh, a lot cheaper to live uh, that's a consideration when he's lost his job basically there are already artists there in that uh, that region um, as a bit of an artist colony. So that's partly why he went there. There's some companionship. But the other artists who went there before him are more conservative in, in style. Later, other artists will join, and there's a sort of school of pont aven influenced by Gauguin. But that, that's uh, a little bit ahead of this moment. So let, let's look at the style first. There's always this question of where to start when you look at an image. And I hope you'll all sort of be thinking about this um, during the course of the course, um, you know, where to start? There's no one right answer. You know, you can start by looking at stylistic issues, or you can start by looking at questions of literal content or symbolic meaning or whatever. Let's just start in this case with with, with style. Very flat sense of two-dimensional design, you know, illusionistic space has disappeared, modeling, there is some modeling, but it doesn't sort of add up to a sense of three solid three-dimensional form. Uh, the background seems almost sort of raised up towards the picture plane rather than perspectival lines helping you to um, have a sense of, the, of deep space. The tree is a, a diagonal. Diagonals in painting sometimes help create a sense of, of the third dimension of perspective. But in this case, it, it doesn't. It sort of cuts across the space of the painting. Actually helps to sort of flatten it out. It's not itself very strongly modeled as a three-dimensional form. It's just another flat thing. And of course, just using a single relatively unmodulated color for most of the background, that also seriously flatten things out. So we're looking at it, We obviously we do see a recognizable scene, uh, but at the same time we're, we're very much aware of shapes and colors as shapes and colors. Uh, the distinctive headdress of the Breton women, uh, Gauguin is very much interested in them, those as shapes themselves, you know, rhythmic forms leading to forms across the surface. He's thinking about the, the compositional arrangement just at the level of forms apart from anything else. Um, another thing of course is the, I mean out outline is very important as it is in other works as I've already had to, to, to say that. Um, color of course, very bright color, non-naturalistic color. moving beyond naturalism. There's no naturalistic excuse for a bright red ground. Actually, there's a sort of disparity. The, the foreground, uh, or the, the sort of figures are all around the edge, in a way, of the painting, in a, in a sort of arc, all linked together. And that's predominantly black and white whereas the rest of the painting has these bright colors, including primary colors, red, yellow, blue, and also some green, the complementary of red, so they antagonize each other and heighten each other. So two different zones of the painting where different rules seem to apply. And I think that's, uh, that's where we have to move beyond just talking about form or formal analysis to talk about content. You can't keep the two things separately. Um, I think he's trying to make that distinction to say, well, this is the real world, 
and this is the, a world of vision. So, oh, the ground can be red because it's not, it's, this isn't happening in the real world. There are no angels wrestling with people in the real world. This has happening in a sort of spiritual dimension. Or if you like, it's happening in the imagination of these people who've just come out of church and may, maybe they had a, a sermon about Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's the title is The Vision After the Sermon. That's what it suggests or to be a little bit more literal, maybe they see this cow and, uh, and it's four legs and two horns and the two horns become, <laughs> become the wings and these are the four legs. Maybe that's a bit over literal, but anyway, the cow is on one side of the big divide. It's not just the color, it's also this tree helps to divide into two realms, not 100% because some of the red is on this side <laughs> as well as the other. But anyway, it helps to kind of align the same idea of two, two realities. Wrestling was very common during a certain kind of uh, festival that they have in Brittany called a pardon. Maybe he's uh, picked up the theme of wrestling from that. But of course, it's a biblical story of Jacob wrestling with the angel, which could be found in religious art. It could be found in the art of the great earlier 19th century French colorist uh, Delacroix, for instance, he paint, painted that scene. Gauguin backs up this kind of interpretation. He says, I believe I've attained in these figures a great rustic and superstitious simplicity. It is all very severe. To me in this painting, the landscape and the struggle exist only in the imagination of these praying people as a result of the sermon. That is why there is a contrast between these real people and the struggle in this landscape, which is not real and is out of proportion. So, yeah, you're coming down to the limits of a, a realistic style, an illusionistic style. Maybe if you want to create a sense of otherworldliness, some sort of spiritual content, it's hard to do so in a realist style. Yeah. Courbet, the realist painter, didn't paint... Um, you know, he didn't paint angels, he says, because I've never seen one, that's why I don't paint one. You know, I only paint what is real. But if you want to paint and engage, engage in your art with spiritual realities, maybe you need a different style. Otherwise people will end up taking a literal-minded attitude towards it all. They're talking there in that brief statement about it being very... S s severe or simple and you know even a few years earlier before his art had become like this he's already talking in his uh, like in, in this is a letter from 1885 to his impressionist friend Pizarro he's already talking about simplification he says more than ever I'm convinced that there is no such thing as exaggerated art I even believe that there is salvation only in the extreme so even three years earlier, he, in his thinking about art, he's already prefiguring this idea that um, you know we've got to simplify and push to to towards some limits. Well, another influence to talk about is that of the Japanese print. We we're already aware that he's interested in it, and we saw how Van Gogh was interested in it. The Impressionists were interested in it, but they all take different things from it. So a Kuniyoshi print uh, of the um, pilgrim, pilgrim, pilgrimage along the Tokaido, so about 1835. It's, it's about, a, well, it's half a century earlier or something like that than the gold guy. It's still, it's, it's not ancient art history or something like that. It's something from your own century. I think you can see why I'm making the comparison the way that the trees in Go the tree in Gauguin's painting boldly crosses the space of the painting coming from outside the space. You can't see where the tree is rooted in the kuniyoshi. It just comes straight across. So that has that sort of flattening effect. You have this sudden big jump from foreground to depth, from the tree to the mountain. There isn't a gradual perspectival development of space. And that all has a flattening two-dimensional quality 
in the case of the kuniyoshi, the flattening of uh, uh, the lack of modeling is, comes partly from the wood cut technique itself. But Gauguin, who, uh, who is free to use the possibilities of oil, oil, oil paint to model, chooses not to. So again, that tree just sort of flattens space by cutting right across cr the whole surface of the paint. And even the down to the detail, it makes me wonder whether he hasn't even actually seen this specific Kuniyoshi work, not just this kind of Japanese print. The, the way that the head dressing, the gear is all kind of very prominent across the corner of the, the painting linked one to another is all very similar to what Gauguin has done. There's nothing, there's no Japanese subject matter or anything, but uh, it's, it's at the level of stylistic influence, I think there's something going on there. And the theme of wrestling also, uh, you know, um, is found in Hokusai, the other great, one of the other great Japanese print masters, one of his, um, you know, his collection of images um, um, includes scenes of wrestling and Gauguin, I think, had a copy of one of the books or something like that. He owned a volume um, uh, of the Hokusai sort of manga. He has another painting where he shows two boys wrestling as well, uh, which he calls very Japanese. This is an example of how the same sort of scene would have been painted before Gauguin came to paint it. I'm sorry I only have the black and white uh, reproduction of this painting. Um, this is by Dagnan Bouveret, not a particularly well-known painter. Breton Women at a Pardon, 1887. So it's some kind of religious ceremony. They're coming out of church. They're wearing their distinctive costume. Um, and then th there'll be some sort of festival, and wrestling will be part of it and all that. So here's an artist on the outside showing us the very distinctive religiosity uh, of the Breton people. I think Gauguin, he's also somehow on the outside, we're, we're, just as we were in the earlier painting of the Breton uh, women, they have their backs to us. But we're not part of their group. We're almost like an anthropologist visiting, seeing their spiritual practices, but not participating. But Gauguin wants to go further than the realist style will, will allow in showing, you know, getting inside their minds, as it were, to show what the, uh, their religious feelings would be. So the limits of realism uh, and the need to move beyond them. Another, apart from Japanese prints, the, the flat, non-naturalistic colors and the compositional arrangement, another uh, influence for the bright colors could be stained glass windows. You know, there are things within the Western tradition where you, once you get back before the Renaissance, you get back to the, to the Gothic era, of course, then you, you might come across very bright colors, um, stained glass windows. And Gauguin tried to, to donate this painting to a, a church, but uh, the priest wouldn't accept it. He maybe it's all too modern, and he wasn't even sure whether someone's playing a kind of joke on him or something. Anyway, it's, it's not appropriate somehow. Uh, but you can imagine in the, the darker light of the interior of a church, maybe these brighter colors would be moderated a little bit. It's more appropriate in such an environment. These are all different possible considerations. It's just conjecture, really. All these kind of costumes were, it's, uh, you know, we think of them as very traditional, and it's certainly, um, it's part of what the tourist gaze picks out even today in Brittany. Uh, but actually, it's a, a sort of modern thing in a way. In the old days, there were what is called sumptuary laws, which meant the laws about how you can dress according to your social standing. And it's only when those laws start to break down 
that uh, then this Bretel dress starts to come up. So it's a kind of um, what the historian Eric Hobsbawm calls invented tradition. You know, a lot of things that we think of as traditional actually sort of invented in a modern period as part of a sort of nationalistic feeling and so forth. Not that everyone was happy about what Gauguin did in a work like this. So his friend, or former friend and collaborator almost, worked side by side, the Impressionist painter Bizarro, really didn't like this work. Now, Bizarro was an anarchist. He actually has very strong political views. Uh, and he sees this kind of shift towards religious visionary subject matter as an escape from the real social problems of the world. It's almost like uh, you know, how Karl Marx talks about religion as the opium of the masses, you know, this idea that religion is a sort of distraction from your actual condition. So this is what Pizarro said. I, I think this is interesting to hear because it's to say there is a politics of representation. Um, or we're looking, what we're looking at here is the the shift from Impressionism to post-Impressionism, maybe it's more than just a matter of an artist got tired of painting in the old style and he wants to paint in some new style or he wants to be more individual or something like that. No, it may be that it's about meanings and those meanings are contested to some extent. So here's what uh, Pizarro says. I do not reproach Gauguin for having included a vermilion background or two wrestling warriors and the, and the Breton peasants in the foreground. I reproach him for pinching these elements from the Japanese, from the Byzantine painters and others. The Byzantine artists will have a, a, a gold background. Again, you know, it's not realistic, but it, it, you know, the, go it, the gold tells you this is an event happening in heaven. It's not actually happening in your world. I reproach him for not applying his synthesis to our modern philosophy, which is absolutely social, anti-authoritarian, and anti-mystic. This is the serious part of the question. It's a step backward. Gauguin is not a seer. He's a schemer who has sensed a reaction amongst the bourgeoisie away from the great idea of solidarity that has germinated amongst the masses, an unconscious idea but a fruitful one the only idea that is legitimate. This may not be everyone's idea of how an impressionist painter thinks, but this is definitely how Pizarro thinks. Oh, here's Pizarro again. The bourgeoisie frightened, astonished by the immense clamor of the disinherited ma masses, by the insistent demands of the people, feels that it is necessary to restore to the people their superstitious belief. Hence the bustling of religious symbolists, idealist art, occultism, Buddhism, etc. Gauguin has sensed the tendencies. So again, he's attacking uh, Gauguin as, you know, this is sort of, all this religious stuff is mystificatory and takes our attention away from the realities of uh, what are the real problems of uh, the life of ordinary people. Actually, I'd like to just suggest that maybe there's something a little bit more complicated than that, that maybe Gauguin is involved with a kind of politics of his own related to the politics of localism, which I, I was talking about when I was talking about the, the question of language in Brittany, the Breton language. It's a distinct language. It's not a, a variant of French. It it's, uh, has more in common, say, with Welsh than with, uh, with, th than with French. Um, you know, the, the s even today in France, I think it's correct to say that the French state doesn't recognize, recognize any other languages than French itself as having any official status. You know, it still tries to create a national uniformity uh, of language. But at that point in time, it was a distinct battle. And as I s gave you the data before, that so many people at that time could only speak uh, Breton language. Um, so 
one of the institutions that was a strong supporter of Breton identity and Bre uh, Breton language was the church. So you have a secular state on the one hand and you have uh, the, the church on the other hand. Uh, and the government official in this area uh, of Brittany, Finisterre, in a report he made um, in 1887, the year before this painting was made, he commented on cases where the priests were using their sermons, which was in the Breton language. Remember, this is the vision after the sermon. They were using their sermons in the Breton language, according to him, to try and influence the voting of the peasants in the national uh, legislative elections in favor of the more, what from his point of view were more conservative candidates, not sort of nationalist, national candidates. Uh, so he, uh, you know, uh, the, the Minister of Public Instruction commented the same year on the, the clergy, the priests in Brittany uh, actively conducting propaganda in favor of the candidates hostile to our republican institutions in his words. So preaching was uh, one of the great sites for the promotion of the Breton language even as late as the 1920s uh, in 474 parishes out of a total of 635 preaching was exclusively in Breton so it's only really after the Second World War that when the number of monolingual Breton speakers declines that the priests start to shift to using French in their sermons. So actually there is a, a politics here of the politics of localism versus centralism, um, republicanism versus um, whatever else you want to call it. Um, so I think Gauguin is sort of sensitive to these to these issues, uh, even if he hasn't fully found a form how to ex express that. Somehow the painting is sort of dealing with that. And just to pick an example of an artist's work from another time and place to show how these sort of issues of encountering people who are a sort of like a, a minority or whatever, or have some different language or culture, uh, is uh, important for artists. So here's an example from a Chinese context, Wu Zuo Ren, who uh, during the wartime period, the, uh, the Japanese invasion period and so forth, uh, like several other artists, he retreated into the interior of China and there he encounters different minority uh, peoples and um, for the first time. So there's a sense of encounter with cultural otherness which is a little bit like what's going on in Brittany uh, for Gauguin. So Gauguin already experienced a sort of an encounter with cultural, uh, cultural otherness within France. Later he goes to Tahiti and the same thing, uh, you know, times ten as it were. But many other artists are experiencing that in different parts of the world as part of the, the modern experience. Sometimes their choice to go, as Gauguin's was, or sometimes it's um, you know forced by war or, or other larger circumstances. Here's a work by uh, another artist, Emile Bernard, Breton Women in a Meadow, also of 1888, which I think we can compare to the Gauguin vision after the sermon. Gauguin had been basically the only adventurous modernistic artist working in pont and had felt somewhat alone there. We know that from uh, what he, 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 he says to a um, uh, letter to his wife, if I can find it. He says, I'm all alone in the room of an inn from morning to night. I have absolute silence and nobody with whom I can exchange ideas. But then Bernard arrives and Bernard is 
also a modernistic experimenting artist trying to change his style, moving beyond impressionism. But suddenly there's someone to dialogue with, and the question comes up of what they are, are getting from each other. Basically, I think that they already have developed their mature styles before um, before they, they come together, so that there's not that much. But it's a muddy picture to work it out for us art historians, partly because Bernard uh, backdated some of the works from that time, making it more difficult for us to work out who did what first. It's a little bit similar to the vision after the sermon, uh, like the, the, the use of an unnaturalistic background color um, that unifies the space and flattens the space. There's the same kind of rhythmic sense of contour. Maybe the, the figures are not joined together in quite such the same uh, rhythmic kind of unity as, as Gauguin's. But, uh, and the other, I suppose the other big difference is there's, there's nothing supernatural here. There are no, there's no angel wrestling with his opponent. In fact, the, the emphasis is more a sort of analysis of social reality. Instead of just showing the Breton women in their costume, we also see uh, people in city dress. You know, actually, this is very, very much against the grain of what normally happens. You know, uh, even when the tourist brochure images. You know, if you, I'm sure you could find tourist brochure images about come to Brittany and they would just show the Breton women in their costume. They won't show the tourists as well. You know, you, you, it's, a, it's a characteristic of, um, of tourist imagery that you, you just show the exotic locals, you don't show the, the tourists. Uh, but here, Bernard, sorry, Bernard is, is, is showing the clashing of urban people and more peasant people. Um, that kind of clashing is a phenomenon of tourism itself, and tourist tourism comes from one of the great um, technological developments and social developments of the 19th century, the development of the railway, which really sh shortened distances effectively between parts of the, the country. You see a little bit of that uh, today with the high-speed rail system in, in China that develops to sh sort of shrinks the country in a little bit. Um, but imagine what it was like before there were railways and roads were often very difficult at certain times of year, surfaces, um, you know, it's before internal combustion engines after all. So some kind of dealing with social realities, unlike Gauguin. But you can see they're very similar artists. Van Gogh saw Bernard's painting, and he made this partial copy after it. This is a Van Gogh work after Bernard's work. Just take a detail of it. So these three artists are having an important dialogue at a period of their personal breakthrough and development, really, or just after they've, they, they've, I would say they've had an initial breakthrough of their own, and then they're having this conversation. But they're very aware of what each other's doing. The dialogue of letters helps to clarify this. Let's go a bit further to this comparison between Bernard and Gauguin. Oh, just before we do that, just to show you a work by Ankata. Ber before Bernard came down to pont a to be with Gauguin, he, he was in Paris, and his main artistic partner in crime was Ankata. So you see both of them are producing these work with very strong contouring sense. To it. This is one of Alcatraz's most most famous work. He's not that famous altogether, but he he he, he 
at a certain moment in history, he was there at the growing age. You know, it's a bit like where you see these um, races, and at a certain point, someone is right at the front of the race, but then by the time the race finishes, they're a long way back behind. You know, uh, Alcatan maybe w was like that. But hey, you know, if you could be at the front of a race at any point in time, you've already achieved something great. You know, but a lot, a lot of artists fall back at a certain point in their career. But you know. Uh, the comparison between Gauguin and Bernard, um, it's an e this is a nice, easy one to make. It's between two self-portraits. Uh, so this is Gauguin's self-portrait, but with a portrait of Bernard in the background. And then here's Bernard's self-portrait, the portrait of Gauguin in the background. It's almost like he's <laughs> saying, well, well, what about the art historians? Won't well, they need something to compare us with? OK, let's uh, do, do some. <laughs> portraits for them. Let's just look at it for a while, actually, you know, because I'm, I feel the responsibility to, to lecture, lecture you. I, I'm talking all the time. But actually, when you come to a new image, what I would recommend you do is uh, forget about words. Just look, you know, when you're doing uh, your presentation, you know, the, the image that you're working on, just look at it. Or, sorry, you have to look at the reproduction probably, but just look at it for, for 10 minutes to see what you can, what thoughts come up. Don't be too logocentric. Don't rush to find out what other people say. Have a, some sense of your own reaction too. Or even if, even if some of the things that come up are things that Oh, I don't really know this, or oh, I don't. Why? Why would he do that? I don't understand anything. You know, even those thoughts. Actually, you could have noticed something. You know, the, that question may be an interesting question, and in answering it, you may come up with some a big new discovery potentially. You know, you, 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 even the feeling of not knowing something can t take you to some interesting place as you pursue it. Another thing you can do is you could make a copy of an image. Uh, you make a drawn copy of a painting. Now, it doesn't matter if you don't have any artistic skill. So what? We're not going to put it on display. But the purpose of making a copy is to force you to attend to every inch of the surface. If you uh, are just looking at an image, you may just focus on the main thing. You know, you are focus on the faces or something like that. But if you have to make a copy, you have to look at each little detail, and that forces you to think, how did the artist do that, or why did they do that? You, you're, you'll have had a little different kind of a, attention. Or, you know, what is that? Oh, maybe it's a sail. Or why does he show the sail but not the boat? Oh, maybe that's an interesting question. You never know. You can come up with... with uh, Oh, I wonder if I can, yeah, what's that? Oh, so maybe this is a Japanese print. That's the colophon. Can I find out what print that was? You know, I mean, all, all sorts of things could come up. What kind of clothing is that? Is that common to dress like, like that at that time? You know, was it common to have this kind of uh, beard or whatever? Beards is a big theme here. So let's then move to the to the words. And um, the reason they're making these portraits is to send to Vincent van Gogh, who is down in R. Uh, so they're portraits for another person. Hence. Uh, uh, putting each other's portraits in it's a, a sort of artistic it's part of an artistic dialogue so this is what um, Van Gogh said well, this is what Van Gogh said first about the Bernard one he said it's just a painter's idea nothing more a few summary strokes but it's chic like a real bit of Manet maybe he's thinking about the the black there's so much sort of black that uh, makes you think of Manet who used black so well Looking at Gauguin's one, 
who feels it's more study than Bernard's. The effect the picture makes on me, Van Gogh says, is that above everything it represents a prisoner. No gaiety is in it anywhere. It's not flesh at all, but one can put that down summarily to his intention of doing something melancholic. The flesh is all blue in the shadows. Here's Gauguin himself talking about this work. He's writing in a letter to his friend Schuffenecker, whose family portrait we looked at earlier. I think it's one of my best things. It's so abstract that it is absolutely incomprehensible. You know, he, you know, this is before we have abstract art, so people use the word abstract in a different sense. At first glance, the head is that of a bandit, a Jean Valjean, uh, and also personifies a despised impressionist painter who has to drag his chains with him through the world. Jean Valjean is the character from Les Miserables, uh, which actually that novel by Victor Hugo, he scribes that onto the title, onto the painting, to my friend Vincent, is a, a dedication as well. Now, of course, Les Miserables has become a, a musical and a film, so everyone is very familiar, even if they haven't read the rather thick Victor Hugo novel. But the hero of that novel is kind of like a, he becomes a prisoner, he's an outcast of society, but actually he's a sort of good person. So that's the sort of persona of the outsider that Gauguin is adopting here. All portrait has to represent someone as something. You know, it's not just what they are, but you, you are many things. You could be a mother, you could be a nurse, you could be uh, you know, many different things. Uh, but you, uh, in any given portrait, you'll only be represented as perhaps one of them. You know, this is my graduation portrait. I'm wearing my uh, academic gown. You know, but that's I'm representing myself as, as a graduate. I'm also other things. I'm a, a doctor or whatever it is that you graduated in. So there's some kind of self-dramatization, a role playing. And he calls himself a, a despised impressionist painter because, as I say, we didn't have the word post-impressionist at that time. The design is very special, completely abstract. The eyes, mouth and nose are like flowers in a Persian carpet and also personify the symbolic side. The colour is quite unlike natural colour. Think of something vaguely resembling pottery under stress in the heat of the kiln. Of course, he, he, there's no uh, colour photo he can send to the recipient of his letter, so he has to describe it. Also, a dedication to to Vincent van Gogh, and this is the the portrait that self portrait that Vincent van Gogh did as part of the dialogue. This is his self portrait uh, to share with the others, and he's representing himself as if he was like a shaven headed Buddhist monk. Again, there's that sort of adopting of a, a persona. After Bernard arrived, uh, I think one of the things he, he Gauguin got from Bernard was just the, so, the self-confident that he had a sort of companion in arms for what he was trying to do. He says about Bernard, uh, here is someone who isn't afraid of anything. So let's just look at a few more works of that breakthrough year, 1888. There's still life with three puppies. starts to sound more confident in how he talks about what he's doing. He says, don't copy nature too much. Art is an abstraction. Dera derive this abstraction from nature whilst dreaming before it, but think more of creating than of actual results. Definitely his manifesto, if you like, is as an artist who you know, is willing to cut the ties with nature, unlike Van Gogh who always wants to be out there 
with his easel in the landscape, never standing back too far from the reality of the world in which we live. So here, no, no shadows except where the shadows can be of help somehow. Um, flat sort of background lifted up, shuts off the space of the painting, outlines very bold, very emphatic, pattern making, two di dimensional decorative arrangement, acceptance of the the flat surface on which the, the, the painting makes is made. Well, Japanese influence again. He's probably been looking at this uh, print by Kuniyoshi of Cats. It's, okay, it's, cats become dogs, but anyway, it's close enough, I think, to think that this could be, you know, the flat surface, the, the, the lack of perspective or space, the strong contouring, surely all this is um, in there somewhere. Was that there's a dimension of um, meaning is all lost across in the transfer across culture. So it's the formal dimensions that are of uh, greater influence. You know, here there's some, I think the illustrating proverbs, you know, asking a cat to look after dried fish is a, a supposed to be some kind of proverb for uh, something that's not very wise to do. So in October 1888, as part of this dialogue between the three artists, Gauguin makes his way to Arles uh, at Van Gogh's invitation, joins him there, staying till around Christmas when he the ear episode of Van Gogh cutting part of his ear off on Christmas Eve and then Gauguin rapidly disappears a little bit worried about his own um, whether he, the knife will come in his direction or not um, so maybe he went because it's warmer down there and maybe he went because of uh, a sense of obligation to Theo Van Gogh Van Gogh's brother who was an art dealer showing some interest in his work uh, and maybe he went because Van Gogh was consistently asking him to. Van Gogh really wanted to create a sense of an artist community in the South. He had that sort of vision and he really wanted Gauguin to join him. A studio of the South he was talking about. As I said last time when we, were, we started the work of comparing the two artists, really um, they'd already had their breakthrough moment, moment, so there wasn't so much they could learn uh, from each other. For a little while, Van Gogh, I think, was willing to play the role of the pupil, uh, and Gauguin was, saw himself as the more advanced artist, but really they end up going their separate ways. As I, as I, as I keep saying, you know, Van Gogh is more cons uh, concerned with nature, even if he also wants to express feelings about it. And Gauguin is much more willing to work from memory, from imagination, or willing to abstract. Van Gogh himself says, I can't work from memory, I can't work without a model. Or he says to Bernard, when Gauguin was at Al, as you know, I once or twice allowed myself to be led to abstractions. At the time, this road to the abstract seemed to me a charming track, but it's an enchanted land, my dear friend, and soon one finds oneself up against an insurmountable wall. So that's the sort of difference between them. Gauguin put it this way. He says, he, Van Gogh, is a romantic, and I am rather drawn towards the primitive. Gauguin says on Van Gogh, about Van Gogh, he likes the accidental quality of impasto, and I detest the messiness of execution. Really, the works that Gauguin does at Arles are not amongst his strongest, you know, partly because he doesn't respond to the place itself in the way that Van Gogh does. But here's some, an example for you. Um, Christ in the Garden of Olives, 1889. I think you, it's hard to imagine this without Van Gogh as a certain sort of expressive quality. Uh, this is, uh, I'm comparing it to Van Gogh, you know, this sort of bright coloration, 
of this work uh, to give you um, something to, to, to compare with. The Red Vineyard at Arles. Or this one of olive trees by, by Van Gogh. You know, think of the trees in the background here. Well, we're seeing the, the difference as much as anything. And Van Gogh working from nature, you can still see today olive trees growing in those fields. But, you know, for Gauguin, it's uh, just the backdrop for a religious uh, scene. He also does a, a portrait of Van Gogh. Remember that Van Gogh himself doesn't quite get round to doing Gauguin's portrait in this dialogue of portraits. Uh, he ends up just painting Gauguin's chair after, after he's left, but Gauguin, much more self-confident perhaps. Interestingly, you don't see the painting that Van Gogh is painting. You just see the side of the easel. What you see behind is a Gauguin painting, in fact, Gauguin landscape painting. So you see in the painting of Van Gogh, you see Gauguin presiding over it. And also we have this sort of viewpoint looking down. We're looking down on Van Gogh, a high viewpoint. Painting his famous sunflowers and everything is the, the contrast of orange and, and blue, which of course is there in prominently in Van Gogh's work too, so maybe Gauguin is thinking about that. This is December 1888, so near the end of Gauguin's stay. Van Gogh writing to his uh, brother. Uh, this is the next year he was writing to him. He says, have you seen the portrait he did of me painting the sunflowers. My face has brightened a lot since that time, but it's just like me, extremely tired and charged with electricity as I was then. And Gauguin says, the idea came to me to make a portrait of him painting the still life subject he was so fond of, sunflowers. And when the portrait was finished, he told me, it's me all right, but me gone mad. I think you, you can, even just from this reproduction, have a sense of the, the fabric of the, the surface on which Gauguin is painting, and you sort of see that it's a fairly rough textured surface. Gauguin often likes this to, to allow the, the texture of the, the support to show, to show through to be part of the work. I mean, that's less the case with Van Gogh, which builds up the surface with impasto, with very thick strokes of paint. So deliberately choosing that a slightly kind of rough surface. Um, the paint sometimes is a little bit chalky in Gauguin's paintings. And he did something that other Impressionist artists also did, is to sort of leach some of the oil out of the uh, oil paint before using it to make it a bit more chalky somehow. It's a very kind of matte, unvarnished surface that he, he creates. The, it's not canvas actually he's using, it's jute, so another plant-based um, material. Using opaque pigments rather than building up layers of glazes. So a lot of these paintings from this time are religious <coughs> themes, but it's religious painting that's quite different from earlier times. <coughs> Actually, a lot of the changes that occurred in art during this period, you could say, is to do with um, uh, religious art during this, is to do with changing desires to express religious feelings. You know, like in romantic landscape painting, a lot of that is to express romantic feeling through landscape, which is never part of traditional religious iconography. 
or Kandinsky's abstract paintings is going to express um, spiritual ideas, but that's all a completely new way of doing it. So this is the Yellow Christ of 1889. There is some naturalistic source here, and that would be uh, there are these colored wooden crucifixes which are in, in the churches in that region. There are also stone crucifixes or whatever that are at, found in the landscape itself. So he's picking up on all that. So it's ambiguous between whether he's showing you an actual crucifix or as if he's trying to say the crucifixion itself was taking place here and now in Brittany. Uh, in the same way as a, a Van Eyck painting will show on a religious uh, scene as if it's taking place in, in present, the present day of, of, of his time because you see the architecture out the window. Strong interest in boundaries, the walls of course. But then the figure of a sailor that helps break the power of this boundary line also tells you you're near the coast, you're in Brittany. So the figure of Christ breaks all the boundaries, symbolically of course, I suppose. Bright red colours of the, the trees. Again, like the, the vision after the sermon, we're, we, we're like outsiders looking in at their religion. We don't necessarily share it distortion of the form, the elongation of the body, but then the Romanesque art, the pre-Renaissance sculptures and, that he would have seen in the churches may also have such a quality. You know, you can look back before the Renaissance to find sources that help giving you permission to, to go this way. Uh, I'm just thinking of this work by Friedrich, the German Romantic painter, where you get a similar kind of ambiguity where is it a, a crucifix that's been placed on the mountain or is it as if the crucifixion is happening on the mountain? You know, there's the same kind of ambiguity. The whole thing is actually <coughs> all to peace. Uh, and just to finish a Gauguin self-portrait where he's got the yellow Christ in the background, although he's changed the, the direction in which Christ is uh, leaning. Partly because he's using a mirror, I suppose, but also for compositional reasons. He's putting himself between the image of Christ and a Peruvian pot, so two cultures. Maybe he's likening himself, the struggling outsider artist, like a crucified Christ or something like that. There's some, some kind of image of um, the ultimate sort of outsider, if you like. Okay, that, that, that's enough for today. I think we'll, we'll stop at that point. We'll, we'll look at the late work of Gauguin next week, in particular looking at the work he did in Tahiti. And uh, then we'll make a start looking at the work of Cezanne, the third of the post-impressionists I want to look at. But I'll see some of you before then in the first of the tutorials on, on, on Friday. So thanks very much.